Okay, so we have Professor Laura Bodies from University of Zurich, and she's going to take us to through the direct detection techniques once more. And uh, uh, she is going to talk on dark, dark matter direct detection, status, results, and future uh, possibilities. Okay, yeah, you may go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so apparently you have heard already quite a bit about direct detection. And um, here I won't spend any time. As you all know, of course, uh, we don't know what the dark matter is, and also we don't know how it interacts, a part that it interacts via uh, the gravitational force. Um, so yes, what it is, I found this nice this sentence in this nice book, a cosmology book for undergraduates by Barbara Fryden. She said a component of the universe that is totally invisible is an open invitation to speculation. So I'm showing here, only the mass range, right, all the way from, from a so-called wave-like dark matter 10 to the minus 22 electron volt, um, all up to maybe primordial black holes or so. So there's really a, a really 80 orders or so of magnitude here. And as you have seen already many times, also many, many orders of magnitude in cross-section. Um, but for the this talk, I will mostly also discuss, uh, you know, the traditional WIMPs, so roughly between a GV and the TV scale, and also a bit uh, light dark matter. So particles which are uh, lighter than, than the typical GV scale. So what we want to do in direct detection, you know, very simplified here is to look for this differential uh, recoil uh, spectrum. Um, that is uh, proportional to the total number of, of target nuclei in a detector. And then you have here the number densities that's related to the local uh, density of dark matter. So in the Milky Way uh, and its mass, and then of course here the interaction cross section. Um, and um, yeah, so as, as I will show you later on, we have many backgrounds that we have to deal with. So we are also looking for some temporal signatures and, and these can be induced by the motion of uh, the Earth around the Sun and then the Sun around the galactic center. So these two combined motions, they will induce an annual modulation in the event rate and also a sidereal modulation. And I will come to this, uh, I will come to this later on. Uh, so yes, traditionally we uh, aim to look for dark matter collisions with nuclei. Uh, and recently, we have also been looking more and more for collisions with electrons in the, in the atomic shell. And this has been made possible by the fact that we have reached these uh, ultra low energy thresholds, as you will see, and also very low backgrounds. But in general, the backgrounds are much higher for, for collisions with, with electrons than, than you know, with, uh, uh, with atomic uh, nuclei. Uh, and we can also look for the for the absorption of, of, of light bosons, for instance, uh, axon-like particles, dark photons, and so on, via, for instance, in the in the case of axon-like particles, via the axioelectric effect. Uh, and there we expect then uh, we expect uh, peaks at the mass of the of the dark matter particle. Should it be, of course, the dark matter. So there are many different fields coming together here. Um, so first of all. Uh, you know, not even talking about experiments, right? Just, uh, just to uh, predict what we should see in a detector. And you have been discussing, of course, a lot the particle physics side, right? So ideally you would tell us really uh, what is the, the cross section and what is the mass, you know, instead of we have always all of these orders of magnitude uh, that, we, that we aim to, to look for. Uh, then, however, it's not only particle physics, because at least for nuclear recoils, but also for electronic recoils, we have to deal with form factors. This is an example here of, of nuclear form factors uh, for, for an isotope of germanium. Then we have to deal with all of the astrophysics, such as the uh, you know, local density. That is only a number, so it scales linearly, as we have seen the rate. Even more important is the velocity distribution and also the escape velocity, because this distribution, we have a cutoff then, and that then will depend, as we shall see, uh, especially the, the sensitivity, the rates at low masses. Right? So we have to combine all of this in order to predict what we, shall, what we should see in a direction, um, well, in a, a direct detection detector, yes. Uh, so coming now to the kinematics, um, you can calculate here the deposited energy as a function of the 
a dark matter particle mass. And this is here, this is by the, uh, by the way from, from uh, Tong Yang's nice study lectures. So these are the nuclear recoils here, the so-called electron recoils, uh, and then uh, some, some detectors that I will mention later actually can also measure phonons uh, where you can go to lower thresholds. So what we see that even for the lightest nuclei for, or one of the lightest helium, uh, the nuclear recoils here for, uh, you know, for a given particle mass, the deposited energy will be very, very low, right? Especially here for the lower masses like MeV or sub GeV. And then you can go to lower particle masses uh, you can probe lower particle masses here with, with electronic recoils, of course, because electrons are much lighter uh, than, than even the lightest nuclei. Um, and, and you can also probe this region uh, with, with phonon uh, mediated detector because you produce more uh, fundamental quanta per deposited energy. Uh, we, we, should, we will come to this when we see the experiments. And this is now another way to put this when we look at the interaction cross-section. This is again normalized here to a nucleon as a function of the mass of the dark matter particle. Uh, you will see uh, these, these sort of shapes here, um, uh, this exclusion limit. So on the one hand side at high masses, uh, the rate just scales like one over the dark matter mass roughly, then here, uh, you know, we have a steep drop in rate for, for light dark matter. And we also have this, uh, also we have the threshold of course for, um, yeah, for nuclear recoils here and the energy threshold in the detector. So we have a minimum velocity here that's dependent on the nucleus mass and also on the mass of the, the particle. And then finally, as I mentioned, we can go to lower masses by also looking at uh, electron recoils. So um, we have different signatures and very roughly we can look for heat or phonons, scintillation light and ionization. And then depending on the type of experiment, depending on the technique, um, you can actually combine two of these signals like heat and light, for instance, uh, like in the Crest experiment or Cosinus or charge and light. And here we have several experiments, especially also the, those based on um, noble liquids and then finally we have phonons and uh, and ionization uh, such as in in super cdms edelweiss and so on because uh, we will see that the ratio of uh, two such observables will give us a handle um, on on the background and in in particular we can say with a certain uh, uh, probability if we observe an electronic versus a nuclear recoil. And then there are also experiments that see only charge or only light, but as we will see, they have then some other advantages. So very roughly the, uh, the direct detection landscape here uh, this year. So we have here the scattering of electrons. Uh, we have uh, quite a few experiments that are targeted at this uh, type of signals, like for instance, Sensei, uh, that's um, a CCD-based experiment, but also other ones, and, and DAMIC as well, but also some of the noble liquid experiments and some of the other ones that uh, found a way to lower uh, their energy thresholds. And then finally, for the um, uh, scattering here of nuclei. I will show you some updates on this, but there are not so many updates right now. Uh, so basically the combined region above, this, uh, above these curves here is excluded okay? with different kinds of experiments, as you can see. Now, what next? Um, so this, uh, this is from, the, from an APEC report. A dark matter report that was commissioned here in Europe by APEC. Uh, so basically, um, yeah, this low, uh, low mass region uh, will be covered by a bolometer type of experiments, CCDs, and also some, some new technologies, uh, while, um, while for, for the higher mass region here, you really need very large and scalable experiments, given that we haven't seen anything so far, of course, with ultra low backgrounds. And here it turns out that these uh, noble liquids are mostly, mostly suited to build uh, this kind of experiments. Um, so there are quite a lot of challenges, uh, also like in high energy physics, we have to deal with backgrounds, but also mm, we have to observe a signal that's very small, so low recoil energies, you know, kV down to electron volt, perhaps even milli electron volt, depending on the mass again, uh, very rare, given that we haven't seen anything so far, we know that we have uh, this uh, 
low mass is less than one event per kilogram year, and at the higher masses we have less event uh, than one event per ton and year. Okay, and as usually the backgrounds are, you know, millions of times, uh, or yeah, higher. So we have to uh, we have to shield the, the cosmic backgrounds. We have to go deep underground, uh, and and uh, even there we have to shield all of the environmental radioactivity, and and we have to use then detector materials that are extremely extremely low in radioactivity. Um, and and well, as I will show you later, for some of the experiments, then we also have to deal with the radioactivity not only of the detector materials, but also of the, the the target materials so the dark matter targets itself um, right so speaking about cryogenic experiments uh, uh, these are as i said phonon based detectors so when you have a particle interaction an absorber uh, and that is uh, an absorber that is coupled here to a heat path you produce for instance uh, you know fast uh, phonons that you can either detect uh, uh, directly such as in, in super CDMS or Edelweiss, or you can you can wait until sorry uh, or in Crest, or you can wait until they thermalize, like in Edelweiss. But uh, um, if you also if you also use for instance either light sensors as in Crest or, or charge sensors as in Edelweiss and super, CM, super CDMS, then you can look at the ratio of phonons um, to to ionization. Or, or ionization to light, and that allows you to discriminate or to reject a large, a large part of the background. Um, so uh, upcoming, it, there, um, there are no really new results this year, apart from what I've shown you uh, um, a few slides ago. However, there are several, um, yeah, Crest will have a new run as well as Edelweiss, Super CDMS is preparing for for then uh, for their uh, yeah larger version at Snow Lab, and basically uh, the um, uh, the aim is to to probe this low mass region until about uh, where this neutrino background will take over. So we will come later to neutrino backgrounds, but uh, these are of course in some sense irreducible. So we have the neutrinos from the sun on the one hand side. Uh, and then uh, at higher wind masses, we will see the neutrinos from, from the atmosphere, so the atmospheric neutrinos um, and the diffuse uh, supernova neutrino background that will play a role. But here at these low masses, we have mostly, we have mostly the solar neutrinos. So these come from a coherent uh, neutrino nucleus scatters of, of, of Bohr-8 neutrinos. So then we have the liquefied uh, noble gases. On the one hand side, we have the so-called single phase experiments. So these are large experiments uh, like the past Xmas or also the, the running uh, deep experiment that have a large mass of, of, of xenon and argon here seen by uh, PMTs. They have very high light yields. Uh, so they can get uh, low energy thresholds. However, uh, they don't have any, uh, uh, you know, they don't have this additional signal so that they can do this uh, background discrimination. Um, and that is much easier in time projection chambers. Mm, so here you have mostly a cylindrical volume of, of xenon or argon, and then you have two arrays of photosensors, one in the uh, liquid and the other one in the gas phase. So you have this vapor phase on top of the liquid. And in the first scatter, you produce uh, what we call the primary uh, light S1, so the prompt signal. You also produce a, free, a few electrons that you uh, drift upwards, so you apply an electric field. Then you have a higher extraction field. You extract those into the gas phase where they produce um, a light signal by collision here with gas uh, xenon atoms that is proportional to the energy deposition. And we call that S2 or the, the, um, uh, yeah, the, delayed, the delayed signal. So the ratio, as we shall see, gives us some, um, ah, sorry, um, I'm not showing the plot here, I thought I have it. So the ratio of the two, again, allows us to discriminate between electronic and nuclear recoils. On the one hand side, uh, their, um, their combined, um, their, their linear combination gives us the energy determination with pretty good resolution, actually. Uh, we also have a 3D position resolution from, uh, uh, on the one hand side from the time difference between the two signals and uh, that's the z position and the xy position from the heat pattern of the light in the top pmt array 
And important, of course, for dark matter searches is also the fact that we can discriminate a single versus multiple interactions because we expect the dark matter particle to scatter only once. But most of the backgrounds, including, of course, gammas, neutrons, uh, they will scatter uh, multiple times. And that's uh, more probable as you go to larger and larger uh, you know, homogeneous detectors. Uh, yeah, so we had uh, we had these experiments running xenon one ton uh, lux dark side fifty and panda x two. However, no um, excess of nuclear recoil events were observed so far. So this is now a combined plot from from xenon, uh, where you can see uh, this is our yeah the standard exclusion region here, and then you can reach lower energy threshold when you uh, look at the S2 um, only at the charge signal, so what we call S2 only. Okay, uh, but of course, at uh, the expense of, uh, of the fact that uh, then you have a much higher background because you don't have this discrimination. So, um, so you lower the threshold, but you have a higher background. This is why the exclusion limits are here worse. Um, now, in, in Xenon 1 ton last year, we have seen an excess, this time in the electronic recall data uh, between 1 and 7 kV. Mm, so here we had a 285 events and expected from background were about 232. And actually, uh, the origin is still not known. Um, you can fit the data with tritium. You can also fit the data with, with uh, solar axions. Uh, or with a peak, for instance, from, from um, axion-like particles and so on. Uh, so the solar axion uh, hypothesis was favored over background only at 3.4 sigma, but there are quite a few discrepancies with stellar cooling constraints and so on. Uh, and, and the tritium is favored over background only at 3.2 sigma. But it would correspond to a really, really small amount of tritium. That's why we were not able to constrain it better. Um, yeah, Laura, so, can, I, can I just uh, stop you one second? So this uh, data yeah. is uh, full data or just uh, partial data? Hmm. That's the full data. The detector was taken apart in um, uh, 2019. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's the full data. So uh, with this current statistics in one ton, uh, we cannot say anything more. Is it more dominated by statistical or uh, systematic? Each point? Um, well, you know, it's really, yeah. So. You know, if I give a talk on this topic, then I show you all the other plots and all the backgrounds no, and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But that, that's a different talk, of course. But yeah, the statistical errors are pretty large. Yes. So it's it's okay. really a matter of statistics because we, um, you know, the spectral shapes for for tritium for solar axions, you have this ABC component, you could have the Primakov mm. component, and so on. So you could, in principle, distinguish between these uh, with higher statistics. Yes. But the, the news is not all bad. <laughs> I will come to that. Um, because, well, the future is already here in some sense. So, um, you know, you need a larger detector, actually also with lower background. So something that I haven't mentioned here, that this flat background is dominated by radon. So, uh, you know, higher statistics, lower background, that will really help, right? So this is what you want to do. And instead of taking a few more years of data, you'd better go and build a better detector, right? With, with, uh, with a higher amount of xenon and also with reduced backgrounds. So there are several experiments here. There's the um, uh, Lux Zeppelin at, uh, at CERF. I will show you a bit more. Xenon Anton in Grand Sasso, Panda X Forton, uh, uh, Jim Ping, and also the Arc Side 20K in Grand Sasso is in construction. Um, so, uh, and there are also two uh, uh, planned experiments, at least two, perhaps three. Uh, so there's a Darwin 50 ton liquid xenon experiment. And I will come, I will show you a slide later on on it, and also a 30 ton uh, liquid argon experiment that's called Argo. But for these, um, for these kind of experiments, now if you go back to WIMPs, the goal is to explore here this gap between the current, um, uh, you know, the current sensitivity and, and more or less this, uh, what we call, you know, we, we don't call it anymore the neutrino floor, but we call it the neutrino fog now because uh, it's not, you know, it's not really a floor. And if you want, you can ask me later. Um, so right, but what is the status of, of these uh, three large experiments? So a uh, Lux Zeppelin has a total of 10 tons of liquid xenon, a Panda X4 ton here below, uh, six tons, and uh, in xenon Anton we have uh, 8.6 tons in total. So that's the total mass, then there is less mass in the TPC. 
um, 5.9 tons, for instance, in xenon and ton. Those, um, all these experiments look rather similar. So we have uh, in each of them two arrays of these three inch PMTs that have very low reactivity and they detect the xenon light directly. So that's light in the vacuum ultraviolet region at 170, around 178 nanometers. Um, uh, once you know you get so xenon is also uh, can be made very pure, but first of all it's self shielding, so you can really um, um, yeah you can suppress the background coming from the walls and so on, but uh, to suppress the background that comes from other uh, noble elements like krypton and radon that are radioactive and that are mixed with a xenon, you have to use removal uh, techniques like for instance cryogenic distillation, right? Um, then, of course, these TPCs are in large cryostats. They are surrounded by neutron shields, uh, muon beaters, so these are large water Cherenkov detectors, uh, and so on. And, and also, you need then uh, quite a few calibration sources. So you want to uh, calibrate your detector response for, you know, for the bands, so the nuclear recoil bands uh, with neutron sources, the electronic recoil bands, you want to calibrate the energy scale. And so, and there also we use internal sources like uh, uh, Krypton 83M uh, and so on. Um, yes, so the status now is um, as that is commissioning at, at SURF. A Panda X40 has first results from a commissioning run. I will show these. And, and in uh, Xenon Anton, we are still, uh, we started a science run this summer and we are still taking data in Gran Sasso. Um, and uh, yes, this is, uh, this is here the projection for, for Xenon Anton and for, for LZ. So this is again, what we had excluded in the past. This is some PMMSM model. I'm not sure if it's still uh, up to date, but, um, and, and um, this is again, this neutrino fog that we mentioned. And here is this, uh, this, new, uh, this new limit by, um, yeah, by the Panda X Forton commissioning run. So this is from an exposure that was very similar actually to the Xenon one ton exposure. Um, and also from a non-blind analysis, um, you, know, you will ask why is their uh, sensitivity better than the one of, of one ton? It uh, looks like they got lucky, they have a background under fluctuation and we had the backlog, sorry, background over fluctuation. Mm, so just uh, two slides or so apart from this one on, uh, on the status of xenon anton. So you can see here the outer cryostat and then uh, xenon uh, one ton was only surrounded by a large water Cherenkov shield. And now we added an inner, uh, inside the water shield, there's another, there's an optically separated region where the water is doped with gadolinium. So it's very similar to, to the Super Kamiokande, um, you know, gadolinium dope project, right? Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, and this is, uh, why is that? Well, because uh, some of the fast neutrons that scatter inside the TPC, inside a xenon, uh, then they make it out. Uh, you know, so if they scatter only once, they're a background for, for us, a nuclear recoil background. If they scatter twice, that's okay. But if they scatter once and make it out, they can then be seen, they can be vetoed by the neutron veto where they get captured on the gadolinium. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we added several, well, there were several changes, of course, there's a completely new uh, TPC, new PMTs, and, and, and many other systems. There's a, a radon distillation column that we didn't have, for example, one ton. Uh, we have the same krypton distillation column. We have a uh, liquid purification in uh, xenon anton. So this is something that again we didn't have. So uh, there were actually quite a lot of um, yeah a lot of improvements. Uh, so um, all of these new systems are actually uh, yeah commissioned and running smoothly. Uh, one of our really nice results, uh, at least you know, from a technical point of view, but of course it influences the quality of the data, is that the fact that the electron lifetime is now seven milliseconds. It was only 0 0.6 milliseconds in xenon one ton, and we have a maximum drift time in n ton of uh, 2.2 milliseconds. So the drift velocity of the electrons depends on the drift field. And of course, the electron is, is a stable particle, as we know, but it's a measure here of the charge that is lost, uh, you know, while they drift from, um, from wherever the event was produced to this liquid gas interface where they get extracted, okay? Uh, so that means you have much, uh, a lower loss in your, in your charge in your S2 signal. Um, also very nice, so uh, initially, actually, we will start now 
uh, rather soon, but initially we have only uh, purified with the renal distillation the, the, the xenon in the gas phase, and we already re reached basically the lowest level so far. It's 1.7 uh, microbecquerel per kilogram. That's already a few times lower than what we had in xenon one ton, and we uh, aim to improve this by at least a factor of two. Uh, so we have uh, 494 PMTs in the detector. Uh, we calibrate them regularly. We determine what is their uh, gain, uh, what is the single photoelectron acceptance, what is the gain. Here are just some plots, the gain versus time. Uh, we also do regular calibrations. Here we just see, um, yeah, so the neutron sources, for instance, americium beryllium, these are fast We can only shine the neutrons from the outside. Uh, then this is a plot where we see the, the, the three cryptos. So this is an internal conversion source. It's a decay uh, with a very short lifetime in the liquid itself. And then we have here these well-defined energies, uh, mostly, um, mostly uh, electrons. And, and we use this also to check the uniformity of the detector response, right, in, in position and so on. Um, yeah, so of, while we have uh, Xenon Anton running and also analyzing data, of course, we have to be prepared for the next phase. Um, so Darwin, the 50 ton uh, scale detector is in design and R&D mode. There's quite a lot of R&D ongoing um, because we may use a different type of photosensors and, and uh, you know, we need perhaps new purification techniques. So it doesn't make sense only to increase the detector uh, because then the background will scale with, with your target, but you have to consider how you can uh, decrease the background further. For instance, we want to reduce the rate on to 0.1 micro per kilogram and so on. And then you, there are a lot of technological challenges as usually uh, is the case. Uh, so we have um, two large scale demonstrators, one here in Zurich, so where we build this large uh, TPC. Uh, so the exact final dimension of the TPC, but in the Z direction where we want to show that we can drift electrons, for example, over 2.6 meters. And then there is another uh, a, a replica, but in XY and flat, that's why uh, they call it pancake at the University of Freiburg, uh, where we want to test, for instance, uh, these large grids. So it's very challenging to, to build these electrodes in the TPC that are, uh, on the one hand side, they have to be transparent, on the other hand, uh, robust, so you don't want any sagging and so on. Uh, yes, yeah, so these, these are actually running in commissioning, uh, and they will test quite a few other also photosensors, quite a few other technologies for, for Darwin. Uh, and recently, uh, there is, um, yeah, we, uh, we got together with the uh, LZ collaboration where we are planning for a, so we have an MOU in place and we are planning for a full merger, a future merger of these collaborations uh, because, uh, uh, you know, worldwide it's very difficult to get all of this amount of xenon and also to overcome, overcome all these technological challenges. I mentioned that uh, xenon anton and LZ are very similar, but there are actually quite a lot of differences if you look into the details, also in the technical details. And, you know, we want we want to take the best out of the both experiments. So we started with a very successful first meeting. We have an MOU that's signed, and now we are setting up, you know, common working groups and, and also governance structure and so on. Of course, so uh, right now we are still in competition, but uh, yeah, but that's okay. Um, so I will come now to a few other techniques. You should let me know how much time do I still have in total just to know yeah, actually, uh, uh, if we assume that we started 10 minutes late, then your time is over. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. I will go over, you know, I will give you the slide. So there are other techniques. I don't have no new results from this, but uh, for instance, these bubble chambers and it especially here for spin-dependent interactions on protons, as, as also Melissa showed, right? There will be this peak of 500 with a very high sensitivity here uh, to, as I said, to spin-dependent uh, wind-proton interactions. There are also some uh, new ideas like having uh, a xenon bubble chamber that's scintillating. Uh, and then we have the sodium iodide experiments with this long, uh, yeah, long-standing result from, from Dama Libra. 
but so far there's actually no evidence for annual modulation from, from other experiments that are using sodium iodide. Of course, nobody else has seen annual modulation either, but uh, here we have especially the COSINE 100 experiment in, in, um, in Korea and COSINE 200 will start at the EMI lab. This is a new underground lab that they build in Korea and also the ANAIS uh, experiment in uh, Spain, in Canfranc. Uh, they, you know, they still need uh, more data to exclude DAMA at, uh, yeah, five sigma or so, or even at three sigma, but these are experiments that are, yeah, in progress. And uh, also there's quite some R&D on directional detectors. So it's very challenging to measure the direction of the incoming recoil, and now it's even more challenging at these very low recoil energies, and uh, given the low rates that we know that we have, right? But uh, once uh, you have, a, you know, the hope is that once you have a discovery and then you know exactly where to look, then you can also, you can also calculate how big such a directional detector has to be. And here again, there are several techniques that are possible, but in general, it's mostly a low pressure gas uh, because you need to measure the, the track of the recoil. And yes, and finally, there are other ionization detectors that I mentioned, uh, such as uh, CCD-based detectors or these uh, spherical proportional counters, where you can have different type of, of target materials, especially also these light targets like hydrogen, helium, and so on, that uh, aim to go, uh, you know, to this, uh, yeah, hundreds of MeV or so masses, so to lower the, the energy threshold and, and to cover this low mass region. And then finally, uh, um, an entire new set of techniques that I didn't even mention here. Uh, and these are, you know, new kind of materials such as these, uh, um, yeah, superconductors, the rock materials and so, so techniques uh, that are just starting. Uh, so many of them were not yet demonstrated technologically, but they are interesting because once again, uh, they aim to decrease the threshold to even much lower values than, than what I mentioned so far. Okay, so we have here MEV, so uh, basically to go to, you know, below MEV here region. So I'm coming to the summary. Um, yes, as you probably have seen, direct detection experiments need to cover this enormous range in dark matter masses and cross sections. So that's been quite a challenge over the years. And then the main challenges are actually to reduce these energy thresholds even further, possibly with this uh, existing, but also with new technologies and also reduce, understand the background while at the same time to increase the target masses to be more, uh, more sensitive. So the main goal is to discover, of course, these new dark species and hopefully yeah, explore all of this parameter space until eventually the solar and cosmic neutrinos will, will take over. Um, but um, having said that, you, know, you can also explore other candidates beyond, beyond WIMPs because of these large masses and low cross sections. And, and there are quite a lot of plans also in neutrino physics, like looking for neutrino as double beta decay with 136 xenon, uh, solar, solar axons I mentioned already, actually also solar neutrinos, uh, and so on. So I will stop here. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Laura Bodies. And uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, I see the hands of Professor Sanjay Swine is already raised. So if you want to add something more. Uh, yeah, I have a very quick uh, uh, two comments. Uh, one, uh, Laura, it was very nice talk. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think you, um, one point you mentioned on slide 20, you said uh, for the Panda, uh, you said that they have a, a non-blind analysis and uh, you kind of put it in the slide. Is, is it a very standard or is it just a something? Uh, well, it has become standard, let's say. So it's always, of course, a question of, um, well, a bit of taste, right? Uh, but um, so as you know, we do blind analysis here, at least in this uh, very low energy region where we, look, where we aim to see this, this uh, nuclear recoil from WIMPs so as to not be unconsciously biased to tune the cuts of our detector, you know, to reduce the background, but maybe even cut away a signal or so, right? Uh, now, of course, um, you can also argue, or let's say some people argue that for a first uh, run or a commissioning run, whatever you call it, um, 
you know, you don't want to do a blind analysis, but we, at least uh, in Xenon, I think we think that uh, that's totally worth doing, right? Because you have quite a lot of uh, what you would call in high energy physics, at least what you would call sidebands, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a small box that you must keep closed, but you can look above your, uh, you know, if you, if you look now, I don't have the plots here, but if you look at the um, uh, charge over light versus lighter, so you can look above, below your energy, uh, your, your parameter space, uh, right of it, and so on. Um, yeah. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, the, uh, we are doing a blind think, analysis, even for the very first data, right? We are uh, so this is told, for us. It's totally clear in in Xenon uh, that the analysis is blind, right? Uh, yes, you can also have techniques where you unblind part of the data, right? That's also okay, yeah. but then you cannot yes. use it to set your limit. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So and then the parameter space, I think is. Uh, it's kind of a very little space which they are to be explored. It looks like many of these things are now kind of ruled out. Uh, so, sorry, which parameter space? This one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess it's some generic. I mean, this the PMSSM, if I remember correctly, has also quite a lot of uh, parameter free parameters, right? I mean, there were some other constraints here. Why this is why this is actually so constrained? No, but I, 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 yeah, sorry. No, I think Professor Swain was trying to say that uh, above the neutrino floor uh, and below the current exclusion, the is very little space. Yeah, is, is not that large. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, that it looks maybe for you it looks not so large, but you know, uh, getting this. So yeah, yeah, this is the same here. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, it's two orders of magnitude here, and it's much more there, right? I, uh, yeah. So, uh, you, I mean, you know, we have been doing a pretty good job. Actually, I have this one plot that I took out that I got that I took from Rick. But um, well, anyway, um, you know, decreasing, increasing your sensitivity always by a factor of ten is is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, other people I, are I, happy I, if they have even increased by a factor of three or so in sensitivity in, in other kinds of experiments, right? So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have this. Sometimes I'm showing this plot. Uh, I don't have it here. Sorry. How the sensitivity uh, increased versus time, right? Starting in the in the late '90s or so. So uh, you know we have been doing pretty well, of course. And um, and yes, this parameter space is not huge, as you said, but uh, it's still quite challenging actually to get there. Yeah. Okay. I think we can move ahead to the next question. Is that okay? Uh, there are two. Uh, uh, two raised hands, I see. I, I, I would like to take up the questions from Shaptokida first. Um, yeah, hello, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you again for the very nice talk. Um, I have a couple of questions, let me try. Um, so you encouraged us to ask, uh, if I understood correctly, that why the neutrino floor is not really a floor. I uh, I was curious about that statement. Oh, right, right. I mean, there is, uh, yeah, let me see. Let me see what's the best plot to show here. Maybe I will show this one. Um, right, so maybe this is a good one to, to, to see. So what I'm showing here is the WIM nucleon cross-section versus the mass, uh, and here the same so let's focus um well let's focus on this one here so you have this uh, several shaded gray areas right and the lightest area here shows this wim cross section when more than one neutrino event is expected in the 50% most uh most signal like s1 s2 region right and then here you have tenfold so it depends on, so first of all it depends of course on the target and so on but here it also depends on what you're saying you know how many neutrino events uh, uh would you expect right so if you think of, about this as a hard floor it's just not the case right because uh um because of these very, very low expected actually rates from neutrinos, at least at least uh, here in the, in this region, right? 
so in that sense it's not a hard it's not a hard floor but it's more like a fog uh you know here as i said you have a uh, one neutrino event is expected then here 10 and so on right uh, so if you would want to build now a neutrino detector so these are here the atmospheric neutrinos then you can see that even with the what, what are shown here are exposure so uh, 1000 ton years so let's say if you have uh you know 50 tons, right? You need to measure for quite some years. So if you have a 10, 100 ton xenon experiment, you measure for 10 years. So that's this exposure. So building a 100 ton is already uh, immensely challenging. And then even waiting for 10 years, and then perhaps you see, you know, very few neutrino events, right? So you need much larger exposures really to get as, as what has, uh, you know, compared to what has been shown in the past as being this, this hard neutrino floor. If you look at it, I'm not sure if this answers now your question. Uh, it, yes, yes, it does. So, yeah, so it's um, it, the floor is fuzzy. Um, it's fuzzy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. I had I had another question on the detector uh, detector front. Uh, maybe you you mentioned this. Um, what are the are there foreseen? Uh, so, Dama was. Um, Scintillator based, right? And Dama is yeah, sodium iodide, the thallium doped scintillator. It's still right. taking data. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so um, what are the other uh, foreseen experiments uh, or or running ones which uh, which are as sensitive as Dama and right. are are scintillator based? And also, um, uh, are these um, so? Who, is there one who does cryo and from scintillator uh, at cryo temperatures they look at the phonon as well as the as right well as right the, yeah. yeah so i have here these three experiments so two uh, are just like dama right more or less room temperature which is a nice as i mentioned they have lower masses but they take uh, about 100 kilograms or so each for now but they take data over over some years so a nice uh, 112 kilograms, you know, uh, so Dama Libra has a higher mass, but they have three years of data and they continue to take data. Now, Cosine Hunter just released the paper. So these were the previous results from Cosine Hunter here. This would be like the Dama regions and the different assumptions. Uh, and they also have three years of data, but they're building actually a new, new experiment that's called Cosine 200. Uh, and they also will plan to operate at somewhat lower temperatures, actually, and to start, uh, yeah, in, you know, next year or 23. But there is one experiment now in construction in Gran Sasso. Well, in planning, construction will start uh, next year or so, uh, but, you know, of the, of the actual detector. So the, the outer parts here have started. So here, indeed, they want to detect phonons as well, uh, apart from scintillation, and to see if they see an excess, whether you know, whether this is more WIMP-like or more, uh, yeah, um, you know, electronic recoil-like or so. But of course it will take them, so, you know, when you build this, uh, this volumeter type of detectors, you start with the small crystals, right? So getting to the mass, even to 100 kilograms is very challenging. Uh, but um, yeah, I think that's a good development that, um, that uh, because this, this kind of discrimination, you know, is not possible with scintillation detectors alone. So you can do some pulse shape discrimination on a statistical basis, but it's becoming, that is very, very difficult at these very low um, uh, recall energies, like around one, two kV, just because you don't have a lot of photons. Okay, uh, thank you. Just, um, yeah, I, I recall a Korean experiment, I think, um, so Kim's is a, uh, right. So Kim's was in the past, right? Was with uh, cesium iodide, uh, Kim's, yeah, and yeah. Uh, now they have cosine. So they built actually they built all of these detectors in house. The crystal they have a very nice uh, um, they have a very nice control over the radio purity of the. So for many years it has been very very difficult for everybody to get the same uh, purity and still is as the Dama sodium iodide crystals. Uh, I mean, there is also a Sabre, uh, and they have a prototype uh, in Gran Sasso, but they also want to build a larger detector uh, in the in the southern hemisphere. So in this new lab in in Australia, there will be a new there's a new underground lab in construction, um, and then um, you know there was um, there was DMIs, and and together with Kim's, they got together 
uh, with the Koreans and they built uh, this cosine experiment, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, this Dama region was, of course, excluded by all these other experiments, but as you said, not with the exact type of, of, of uh, scintillator, right? The exact type of material, let's put it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sima, uh, you, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks, Shabadita. Thank you, Laura, for a nice talk and for agreeing to talk. I have a quick question on what uh, Shatiki was asking about the neutrino floor. So, are there any special techniques one has to use in that sensitivity region? Special techniques to use, say again, in? I mean, as we go down to those limits. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, uh, I mean you can get. Especially you saying the backgrounds are huge, right? You mean, but uh, so you want to say if there are special techniques to um, to overcome somehow yeah. this neutrino yeah. floor? Uh, well, yes. Uh, so, for example, if you have directional information, and if you're talking about the neutrino floor that comes from the sun, from neutrinos from the sun, then that would help. So there are quite some studies on that, um, uh, and uh, for the um, for the atmospheric neutrinos, so for the higher masses here, you know, that's, um, yeah, that's much more difficult, right? Because the atmospheric neutrinos, they really come from everywhere, right? From the sun, if you can correlate the background with the sun, while the, you know, dark matter should not be correlated with the direction of the sun, right? That would help, but for the atmospheric, actually, uh, that will be, that will be quite challenging. Um, so, you know, you none of the about... current experiments are using those information yet. Well, I mean, not, nobody needs it right now because okay. we are really far from the neutrino far floor. From that. Absolutely, yeah. I okay. mean, far, you know, not as far as uh, 20 years ago, let's say. Right? We are much closer now, but not yeah, quite there. I mean... <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we really yeah. need uh, to build like Darwin, for example, and that take will take another, I don't know, 10 years, and then you need 10 years of data and so to, to get there, right? So yeah, it's yeah. exciting no. to approach this neutrino floor, but it will take some time. And that's why okay. of course it's good to think uh, what, uh, what to do once you get there. You know, if you, have a, um, if you have a discovery on the way there, right? And you have a certain rate of WIMPs, then that's okay, right? But you, if you haven't seen anything as you're approaching, as you're approaching uh, this region here, then it will be really hard to disentangle. I would say, um, still the neutrinos are standard model particles. You can predict better. You, you can, you know, you can, pre well, okay. There is also the uncertainty on the atmospheric neutrino flux at these low energies. And that's, non that's quite significant, no? Uh, because that's been inferred. It's not really measured. It's not really measured in, in, in uh, these energy ranges. So there's, I don't know what it was, maybe 10% or so uncertainty there. Uh, so, yeah. So that's something else that we will need to deal with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. Okay, so is there any other question? Uh, if not, uh, then uh, uh, can I ask uh, about uh, one short quick question about this neutrino flow that neutrino fog rather that you have pointed out. So here, yes, fog gets denser as you go down to the wimp nucleon cross section so this this is something which i was trying to understand because we estimate this uh, floor or the fog by having this uh, phi into sigma nu uh, which is equivalent to phi into sigma dark matter something like that so from that we try to estimate that uh, 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 the cross section in the wimp nucleon uh, uh, cross section plane versus wind mass, something like that, right? So, uh, uh, why it is getting denser while we are reducing the wind nucleon cross section was uh, was something. Uh, oh I no! Know. So 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 sorry. Denser in the sense that you see in this study you're asking you're here you're asking that you see say one event in this fifty percent most signal like region. Here you're asking that you will see ten events, right? So to see ten events, you need to go to lower cross sections, right? Okay. Okay. Well, if you want to see one neutrino event, that uh, will show up somewhere here. 
if you want to see 10 neutrinos from, from the neutrino floor, uh, then um, that, you know, so I don't know, maybe here it's easier to see. So this is another similar study uh, by, by Charan. So here it's a bit differently written. So it's a discovery limit of a 5 TV wimp here in Argon, in, in Argon story as a function of the, um, the, the atmospheric uh, neutrino event, right? And also the fractional, here they also consider this fractional uncertainty uh, mm. in, in the neutrino flux, no? Uh, so I don't know, another way to put it is that at some cross section, at some cross section, you will start to see one neutrino event. If you go to lower cross sections, uh, these are the dark matter cross sections, right? Then you will see more because then your neutrino will already start to give you more background events, no? The lower the cross section, the higher the background will be from the neutrinos. Got it. Yeah, that, that's... Right? I don't know, maybe that's another way to put it, no? The yeah. lower the cross section that you probe for WIMPs, the higher your event rate will be from, from this neutrino background, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's so, so what this plot shows is that as you get here to what we have always been saying, 10 to the minus 48, 49, that this background from the neutrinos will not be very high yet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It depends a lot also on the energy. So, so um, it depends, of course, on the th energy threshold as well, right? But yeah, because of the exponential form also of the... Of the nuclear recoil spectrum. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, if there is no further question, so let's thank Professor Laura Bodis for an excellent talk and uh, discussions. And uh, uh, we close the session today. Then. Yeah. Thank you also for the very good questions. The, yeah. yeah. Thank you all the speakers. Thank you, Sudhati. We'll meet tomorrow 9 30. We have uh, interesting I think, G minus two talks as well as uh, dark metal pedagogical talks. So we'll meet uh, tomorrow at 9 30. Yeah, so uh, my thanks to all of you to, so that we could get connected. And yeah, okay. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.